Production funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers. Working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSEC, working for communities across New York State. Hey now, let's take a moment So we all can figure it out What it's all about It's the Homework Hotline The Homework Hotline The Homework Hotline The Homework Hotline And welcome to Homework Hotline. I'm Joe Zaniga. And I'm Sam Simpson. Homework Hotline is the place where you get the tools you need to succeed both in and out of the classroom. Now for more information on Homework Hotline, go to our website, homeworkhotline.org. Here you can find games and other online resources and the latest episodes of our show. We would also like to remind our viewers that a little later in the show, Kim Sagewick from the Harriet Tubman Home and Reverend Paul Carter from the Harriet, Harriet Tubman Home will be here to tell us about the Moses of the Underground Railroad. Abolitionists were people who advocated for the support of a, advocated for and supported the abolishment of slavery. But not all abolitionists supported the Underground Railroad. Many abolitionists were actually against helping slaves escape. They did not believe in breaking the law and wanted to find a legal way to end slavery. If people were caught housing a runaway slave, they could face a fine of up to $1,000, which would equal over $29,000 in today's money or they would face jail, and most people were not willing to face those punishments. All right, now we wanna know, would you be willing to help someone, even if it meant putting in, being put in jail or paying a large fine? Why or why not? Now you can weigh in on this topic and tell us what you think by visiting us on Facebook and leaving us a message, tweeting us by using the hashtag HHVoiceIt, or by visiting our website, homeworkhotline.org, <coughs> and clicking on the Voice It button. Remember, the most thought-provoking responses will be put on the air. The answers will be, short, be shared on Wednesday's Homework Hotline. Today is Thursday. That means it's time for our science challenge. What do you got for us this week? Well, Sam, I want to talk a little bit about boiling. Okay. Okay. So we think of something when we boil something, we heat it up and right, it bubbles right. and it starts to bubble. Yeah. But basically for something to boil, what has to happen, the reason we hit those bubbles is the the vapor pressure, the pressure of those bubbles trying to mm -hmm. form a gas and get out, got to be equal to the air pressure. Okay, right? cool. All right, so um, not all things boil either at the same temperature, right? right? We know something right. boils at much lower temperature. So I have a liquid in here, some and I'm just going to have you. Yeah, some blue stuff. It's got actually food coloring in it. Okay. But I'll have you hold it in your hand like that. All right. And we see really there's nothing happening, right? Nothing happening. No, it's definitely not boiling, right? <laughs> definitely not boiling. All right. But I have that same liquid, okay? A um, little lighter in color, and this little contraption, we've got a bulb here, and it goes up through one of those kids, like a sippy straw, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have a, another little bulb at top, and if you notice, it's sealed, all mm -hmm. right? So this is sealed, and so I'm just going to hold this in my hand, and if you can see, it's going up the straw, up the top, cool. and this is definitely boiling. Definitely boiling. All right. And so I did heat it up a little bit with, with my hand, and not that my hand's any hotter than yours, so we could do the same thing I could have you hold it. All right. But there's got to be something else that's causing this to boil. We certainly heat, heated it up a little, and that's not the answer I'm looking for. But I am going to look for the, for the answer is why. It's doing slower. Yeah, why did this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably because I already started at once. Okay. But uh, why, does it, you know, why is this liquid boiling? All right, now I'm not looking for the heat part of it. I want to know why is this liquid boiling? Again, our science challenge for tonight is why did the liquid boil? There it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. If you think you can solve the science challenge, give our hotline a call at 1-866-264-5904 or you can answer on our website, homeworkhotline.org. Answer correctly and you can have a chance to share that answer at the end of the show. Now remember, every correct response we had our Hotline Hall of Fame earned enough points and you could win a tablet at the end of the season. Throughout February, Homework Hotline will be celebrating Black History Month. This week, we'll be taking a look at the Underground Red Railroad. Today, we'll take a look at Harriet Tubman and how people can travel using the stars. All right, now today, we're going to get things started by taking a look at Harriet Tubman. Let's walk on over. Yeah. Great. 
Okay. Thank you for being here, guys. Um, Thank you for having us. <laughs> right. Who was Harriet Tubman, and why was she such an important figure in history? Well, Harriet Tubman is born enslaved in Dorchester County, Maryland. And she's born about 1822. When she's mm -hmm. 27 years old, she hears that she is going to be sold away from her family. So she makes the decision to escape. She's going to be a freedom seeker heading north, and she does this on her own. She gets all the way to Philadelphia, and even though she's so excited about being free, she starts to miss her family. Mm -hmm. She said, well, if they're free, if I'm free, they need to be free as well. So over the course of the next 10 years, she makes about 13 trips back down wow. into the slave state of Maryland to bring family, friends, and other African Americans out. Cool. Now, were conductors like her typical, or is she the exception? She is really the exception. Okay. So there's a lot of conductors, both in the North and South, and they were both enslaved American, uh, African Americans, they were free black people, they were uh, white sympathetic people. All of them could be considered conductors. But what they mostly did was just take someone, a freedom seeker, from one station on the Underground Railroad to another okay. one. What made okay. Harriet so different is that she took them from station to the station, station to station, station. Okay. all mm. the way north, and many wow. times she took them all the way to Canada. Wow. Mm. Did Harriet Tubman ever get caught? And if not, why was she so successful? <laughs> no, Harriet never was caught. Uh, she was successful because most of her journey she made was during the nighttime. Okay. Uh, so therefore, the only problem she had was whether she was being chased by those uh, enslavers who were trying to recapture her. And many times she was a master of disguise, and she knew how wow, to use. She wore disguises, huh? On, on occasion, she did uh, wear disguises, but she sometimes would do things that keep from being caught. Such as one event was whenever she was in a town and she saw one of her previous owners and she knew that he would recognize her so she had these chickens in her hand and so the closer he got she uh, did something to the chickens to make them flutter in the air and as they fluttered she sort of went down and and and, and so therefore he was unable to see her wow. and then there was another event where she was uh, knew that someone would recognize her so she picked up a newspaper and started reading it and then of course they knew that she was she had to not be free be because she, she was be. not enslaved because cool. enslaved people at that point didn't really know when to uh, know how to read so she went on and was not recognized because of oh. that so she was never captured because she oh. was a master of disguises and knew how mm. to get away now what was her involvement with the Civil War well Harriet Tubman was doing the Civil War she was a nurse a scout a spy for the Union Army. Uh, she also taught other young ladies how to bind up the soldiers' wounds, how to, how to cook, clean, things of that sort. And uh, she was one of the only women that we know of who led troops into battle during the Civil War, cool. uh, during a raid on the Combahee River in South wow. Carolina. She led troops in, huh? Led wow. troops in mm -hmm. with uh, Colonel James Montgomery. Cool, cool. So she, I know the Harriet Tubman home is in Auburn. Well, how did she end up in Auburn, and, and what kind of things did she do there? This is such a good question. Central New York was really known for progressive thinkers. Yes. So there were a lot of underground railroad safe houses within the area. So one of them, especially, was in Auburn. Mm -hmm. There was the home of William Seward and his wife, Frances. And Harriet Tubman had actually gotten to know them through other connections on the Underground Railroad. Okay. Now, Francis, um, sorry, William Seward is the senator from the state of New York at that time and will become the Secretary of State under Abraham Lincoln. Uh -huh. The uh, city of Auburn also has a very well established African American community, so she wasn't starting over from the beginning. Mm -hmm. There were already a community there for her. And William Seward and his wife, Francis, sold Harriet Tubman a seven acre farm on the outskirts of Auburn. Mm -hmm. And it was there that she made her home for the last 50 years of her life. Wow. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. wow. Now her home and church were recently made into a national park. Mm -hmm. now, tell us a little bit about that. What was that process? Well, it's um, the process <laughs> is a little bit on the long side, but the National Park Service is in the forever business. So what happened was we have uh, the National Park Service, like when they get it, uh, a park, that particular area is going to be saved into perpetuity forever wow. for the American people. So the Harriet Tubman Home Incorporated and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church worked with Congress people to write legislation to make the site a national park. 
So this particular park that was created, the Harriet Tubman National Historical Park, is a partnership park. So we work very closely with the Harriet Tubman Home Incorporated and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, who has been taking care of the property for over 100 years. We're going to work together to create new programming. We're going to work on the restoration of many of the buildings. The um, National Park Service has actually purchased Harriet Tubman's church mm -hmm. that she wow. um, raised mm -hmm. money to build. She attended for 22 years of her life and she was buried from there in 1913. So we're going to be working real collaboratively as well as with other museums and organizations in the city of Auburn to um, to make sure that everybody knows about Harriet Tubman. Yeah, because it's necessary that they know who this lady was and what she did and how important she was to the country. You do a pilgrimage there every year, don't you? Every don't year they? in May. Uh, this year it'll actually be June the 2nd. There's okay. a Harriet Tubman pilgrimage where we have an event that goes on at her grave site in the morning and then we come back to the property for a day of activities and celebration. Yep. Uh, president's been been to visit you guys? Yes, there? yes. President Clinton did come in okay. the year 1999 along with uh, the First Lady. Cool. Uh, they've been there and invited my wife and I to the White House. So we, wow. you know, it was a good, it was a good year for us then. But we've had uh, many mayors and other people from um, the political arena there cool. as well. Cool. Oh. Well, thank you very much. Yes, thank you for having you. us. All right, now we'd like to thank Kim and, and Reverend Paul Gordon Carter for being here tonight. And when we come back, we'll take a look at our book reviews. So stay right there. Having trouble deciding what the author's purpose is? Why don't you have some pie? Persuade, inform, entertain. Authors write to persuade or convince the reader of a certain point of view, to inform or teach the reader new information, or to entertain the reader. Now, you know, it's, it's interesting because I've been to the Harriet Tubman House. And I actually took a group of seventh graders there about 10 years ago, and we mm -hmm. ran all over the rounds and everything. So it's pretty cool. That's very cool. You know, to have something like that so close, yep, we yep. should take more advantage of those things. Yes, we should. Okay. And now let's take a look at this week's Hotline Book Reviews. Check them out. My name is Hanan, and the book I will be reviewing today is Dark Diary 7, Tales from a not so Gum TV Star. The author of this awesome book is Rachel Renee Russell. The genre is fiction. The main characters are Brandon, Nikki, and Mackenzie. My favorite character was Nikki because she can relate to so many people. She is funny and she makes me feel happy and excited when I read her stories. Nikki Maxwell gets a call from Trevor Chase, a TV producer. The call is about her band's new song, Dork's Roll. Trevor Chase wants to meet at a concert to talk about the song, so he gives Nikki three backstage passes to meet up with him. Nikki brings Zoe and Chloe to the concert. When they get there, Mackenzie is there and she brags about her front row seats. In response, Nikki and her friends start bragging about their backstage passes. Mackenzie distracts Nikki, Chloe, and Zoe and steals their backstage passes. Nikki, Chloe, and Zoe try talking to the security guard. They disguise themselves and they hopped into a rolling cart going backstage. Will they ever make it back to talk to Trevor Chase and become TV stars? Read tales of a not so glam TV star to find out. Personally, this book connects to my life and may connect to yours because it teaches us a lesson. Don't bite off more than you can chew. My favorite part is when Nikki dressed up as a dancer to get backstage because she wobbled on the heels. I would recommend this book for anyone seven or older and people who like funny stories that relate to real life. Hello, my name is Jack and I will be talking with you about The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane by Kate DiCamillo. The characters are Edward Tulane, Abilene, Bull, Lucy, Bryce, Sarah Ruth, Lawrence, and Nellie. My favorite characters were Bryce and Edward because Bryce tries to protect his sister no matter what, even if it has a terrible impact on himself. I liked Edward because so many things happened to him throughout the book and his personality changed because of these experiences. The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane is a story about a rabbit made of china who was given to a young girl named Abilene on her birthday when she was little. Now she is 11 years old and is going on a boat, the Queen Mary. 
When they are on the boat, two boys started playing with Edward and accidentally throw him overboard. After that, Edward has a crazy journey meeting so many people along the way. For example, he meets a hobo and his dog, an old fisherman and his wife, an abused boy and his sister, and a dial mender who owns a dial shop. I love this book. It was so hard to put down and surprised me at some parts. It also had an amazing and unexpected ending, which made me love this book even more. I recommend this book to people who love excitement and adventure. Hi, my name is Veronica. Today, I would like to share my thoughts on a book that I recently read. The book is a graphic novel called Smile by Raina Telgemeier. The main characters of this book include Raina, her sister Amara, and their mom and dad. Raina is my favorite character because she is a lot like me. For example, she is very funny and easy to understand. An interesting part of the book is where Raina and her friend come home from a Girl Scout meeting and Raina races her friend to the door and suddenly trips, falls, and that rips her two front teeth out. After this, Raina has trouble making new friends as her current ones are a bit mean. There is tons of drama regarding her love life as well. For example, Raina is kind of dating a sixth grader and she's in seventh grade, which is kind of embarrassing because her friends tease her about this. Her boyfriend asks her to a dance and she says yes, but does not end up going. She also has a crush on a boy named Sean. Will she ever find new friends and get out of this mess? If you like dramatic graphic novels, then you will love Smile. You can find this book in the graphic novel section of your local library. There is also a sequel called Sisters as well. Cool. <laughs> you know what's cool about this? Is these are fiction books, but these kids recognize the morals in them or yeah, how, to, yeah. how it related to their own lives. Yeah. yeah. Smile. Have you ever lost your two front teeth? <laughs> Man, I chipped one. <laughs> All right. Now, if you'd like to see these videos again or others like them, you can go to our website, homeworkoutline.org. And now I've got a little okay. and continuing with our, um, our Black History Month. I'm going to talk a little bit about Frederick Douglass. Cool. So, um, Frederick Douglass actually wrote his newspaper here. He actually lived in Rochester for a considerable amount of time in front of School 12, one of our local elementary schools. There's a little plaque because that's where his home was. And Sam shared with me earlier the church that he attends was actually where he printed his, his, uh, his newspaper which was called the North Star. And you know, I'm a science teacher, I like to bring science into everything. So let's talk a little bit about the North Star because we also know the North Star is Polaris. And why would Frederick Douglass name his newspaper the North Star, all right? So Polaris is the technical name for the North Star. It's also sometimes called the Pole Star, all right? And it's a larger star. It's much larger than, the, than, our, than our sun, which is an average size star. Now it tends to be located almost directly overhead for her, an observer that would be at the North Pole, and it's over 433 light years away. So the, if we go out tonight and you look at the North Star, if it happens not to be too cloudy, think that that light that you're seeing from that star left over 433 years ago, traveling at the speed of light. That's how far away it is. So even though it's so large, it appears just uh, like an average star of the other stars in the night sky. So let's talk about that. The Earth Science students are gonna recognize this as one of the tables out of the Earth Science um, reference table, and if we look at this, this is a, a, a pattern that shows the characteristics of the stars. On the x-axis, it shows their temperature, which is related to the color of the star, and here on the uh, y-axis is actually the size of the star. So as we go up, they're larger, and as we go this way from the right to the left, which is opposite what we usually think, they're actually hotter. So on this side up here, we'd have very large, very hot stars, so it would appear blue, down to this side would be the smaller red stars, and they'd be much cooler. So right here in the middle, here's our sun. Remember I said it was an average star? And if we look up here with this, uh, this area here called the Giants, notice that Polaris is over a thousand times larger than our sun, and we think of how huge the sun is, but it's so far away, it appears just like other stars. And we see some of the other stars you may recognize. So. All right, so we know that Polaris is a big star. Why is it, what's it still have to do with that, with that newspaper? Well, the North Star Pole Star, and we said it's, it's also located nearly directly overhead for somebody at the North Pole. Well, why is that important? Well, if we think of a globe, 
And we notice globes always have a, a tilt to them. That's a 23 and a half degree tilt that's the same as the Earth axis. If we were to take a line right through that globe, all the way up from somebody here at the North Pole, this is where Polaris would be located, somewhere like that. All right, now let's take that if we look at the Earth and we were to put an imaginary line through that axis and followed it up, we'd see that the Polaris or the North Star would be right on that axis. So if we were standing at the North Pole, we'd have to look straight up to see, the, see Polaris. All right, now, remember we said that when we looked at the sun and the moon earlier, we talked about that the Earth's rotation actually caused that movement we see. So the stars, like the sun and moon, would rise in the east, set in the west. Their motion would be an arc from east to west. So if we were to look in the western hemisphere, we'd see they'd be arcing down this way. Eastern hemisphere, they'd be rising, arcing up that way. But the important thing is, if we were to look into the northern hemisphere, we'd see that Polaris, because it's directly above the North Pole, would appear to be stationary, and all the other stars would rotate around it in a counterclockwise direction. All right, still, what does that have to do with Frederick Douglass? Well, it's located, Polaris is actually located in Ursa Minor, which stands for Little Bear, but it actually, it's the Little Dipper. And that could be easily found by, if you recognize the Big Dipper, which is actually Ursa Major. So those are pretty easy things to spot in the night sky, even if you don't know the sky well. So here's Ursa Minor, Polaris is the last one in the, uh, in the handle, and this would be Ursa Major, this is what the Big Dipper is. What happens is if you go out and look at, find the Big Dipper, so one of these nights go out and look at it, if you look at the last two stars in the bowl and you take that distance five times and follow it out, that will take you to Polaris. Even though over the course of night this will rotate around Polaris, it will always have these two stars called the pointer stars pointing at, um, pointing at Polaris, pointing at the, at the uh, North Star. Now, like I said, the Big Dipper is something fairly easy to find in the, in, the, uh, in the sky, and if you can find the Big Dipper, you also should be able to find Polaris fairly easy, right? Still hasn't said what does that have to do with, um, with Frederick Douglass. Well, for an observer we said at the equator, if we happen to be at the equator, we would see that Polaris right on the horizon because of that, at zero degrees. If we said if we were at the North Pole, we're gonna see it directly overhead at 90 degrees. But the interesting thing about that is if we were to travel, for example, to 30 degrees, we would see Polaris at 30 degrees above the horizon. If we were at latitude of 60 degrees, we would see Polaris at 60 degrees above the horizon. And so, oops, there we go. Oh, went one too far. For the slaves that were escaping from the south, they would be able to spot the Big Dipper, they could look for Polaris, and it'd be easy for them to find it in the night sky, and as they traveled north, they would see Polaris getting higher and higher in the skies, so as they were traveling towards the north or towards Canada, towards freedom, Polaris would have been an easy thing for them to spot, or as it more commonly was called, the North Star, and that actually is the name of the magazine or the, the newspaper that Frederick Douglass published here right in Rochester for many years when he also lived here. So, there's inject a little bit of science into everything, but you know that these people knew enough about the sky from their culture or wherever that they could look into the sky, find that star, and follow it towards freedom. The Netherlands is a small country that is located in Western Europe between Belgium and Germany. This country might not even exist today if it was not for the Dutch. The North Sea would have washed the Netherlands away over the centuries, but the Dutch built a series of canals, dams, and pumping stations to keep the sea and rivers from flooding. Animals have had to adapt to the canals and dams just like the people who live in the Netherlands. The government has created animal sanctuaries throughout that allow for plants, birds, and small animals to thrive. If you visit the Netherlands, you will see tulips and wooden windmills. The windmills have helped drain water from the land for over 600 years. Today, the Dutch use other sources of flood control that are more modern. Many people also ride bikes in the Netherlands. There are three times more bicycles than there are cars. Sam, we got a winner in our science cool. challenge. Who do we have out there? Who's our winner? Uh, hello? Hi, is this Yassim? Yes. Hey, what was going on here? Why was this able to uh, boil when I just... Um, the water was boiling. It was because there was, uh, there was more, there was lower pressure in the bulb than, it, 
that then the air pressure. You got it. You know what I'm giving you a hint? Great it's job. not water in here either. It's actually a, a type of alcohol which boil, boils at a lower temperature, but you're right. This is under a, a partial vacuum. The, the air pressure is low in here. And so in order for things to boil, if we are at a lower pressure, they actually will boil at a lower temperature. You often oh. see um, a lot of recipes will have a different recipe for people at higher elevations like right. in Denver definitely. because of the... Definitely. Yeah. So you did a great job. How would you know that? Did you have to look it up or did you know? Well, actually, I kind of know it, but I still have to look up just to make sure. <laughs> hey, well, that's good. It's great that you looked it up to make sure because you were absolutely right. You did a great job. Congratulations. Congratulations. But don't forget, every Kirk response goes in our homework outline Hall of Fame. Or enough points, you can win that tablet at the end of the season. That's all that we have time for tonight. Next week on Homer Hotline, we'll be taking a closer look at the Harlem Renaissance. Good night. Bye, guys. Funding for Homework Hotline is provided by New York State United Teachers, working to educate and assist students, provide medical care and support, and strengthen local communities. NYSET, working for communities across New York State.